our next presentation is Paddy, um, who's actually going to be talking about decentralization. And, and this is actually quite an important topic because it is at the core of many of the topics we, we're actually looking at um, over the next couple of days. And I think what, one of the great things um, that we saw there from Mason was a real live example of, of, of a major brand and how they're using it. But Paddy, I'd like you to explain, I know you're a geek, I know that you didn't want to be here today because your boss said you've got to go and speak. So you, you're a CTO, you're going to talk UX, you're going to talk. Can you make it simple for us so we understand what you're saying? I'll try. Thank you. Loads of use, Paddy. Thank you. Okay. Hello. Hello. Um, very interesting chat from uh, Mason earlier. So I am going to delve into decentralization in a blockchain world. You know, what is it? Why do we need it? How do you spell it? You know, that, that sort of thing. So, do you ever wonder what it is that we could achieve? Do you ever think to yourself, you know, how high could we fly? Do you ever want to know if we are going to achieve what it is that we can achieve? Because when you think about it, everything starts with freedom. We have to be free if we are going to achieve what I refer to as our final form. What is humanity's final form? Well, freedom requires censorship resistance. If you can be censored, then you are not free. If somebody can stop you from saying something to somebody, then you don't have freedom of speech. If somebody can stop you from sending your money, your value to somebody else, then you don't have monetary freedom. So if you want to be free, no one can censor what it is that you want to do. Freedom is a right, it's not a privilege. It's something that we have to have. It's something that we should have. It's a must have, not a nice to have. Now, censorship resistance requires decentralization. Why is this? This is because centralized systems are so easy to attack. Whenever you have a system, it doesn't matter if 99% of it is decentralized. If 1% of it is, de is centralized, then that is the point where the attack takes place. That is the place where whoever it is that wants to censor you will focus their attack. So censorship resistance requires decentralization. And the only known way of achieving this currently is through decentralization. Because if we were capable of doing it, we would have done it by now. And currently there, you know, there are no systems, BB, before Bitcoin, before blockchain, that allowed us you know, this ability. Now, 12 years ago, when we tried to do this, we simply didn't have the technology there was no way for us to come to consensus in a decentralized environment. This was the problem. This was the, the issue that we couldn't get past. And then along comes Satoshi, and he says, actually, here's a system, here's some technology. And what it lets you do is it means that we can come to consensus in a decentralized way. What it does is it means we don't need to have a focal point. We don't need to have a central party that you know, we send all our information, all our wishes, all our results to, who can then disseminate that information. That was a really, really, you know, that was impossible, BB. That was impossible before blockchain. And so if you want to do a system that operates in a censorship resistant way, you know, you have to use a blockchain. You know, they're very slow, they're very clunky, they're very expensive, but they do this one thing, and they do this thing that nothing else can do. And so if you want to have the decentralization, so that we can have the censorship resistance, so that we can be free, 
You have to use a blockchain. That's what it's for. And that's why we need the decentralization. Let's do a thought experiment. I call this uh, CentraChain. It's a completely centralized blockchain. Uh, basically, it runs in EVM. I remove the blocks. Whenever you send me a transaction, I instantly process it. I don't wait. I don't go through all the pain. I don't go through all the, you know, the complexity that we have to go through to get a blockchain to work. I just run the whole thing on one big bad boy server and I let you all access it. Yeah? Why would I do that? It's a thousand times faster. More. It's a thousand times cheaper. I'm basically getting a million X, getting a million times throughput by removing this element of decentralization, by saying, look, don't worry about coming to consensus in a decentralized way. How fast can you run this EVM? You know, can we use all the tech that people have built, all the wonderful applications that have been built on Ethereum, all the Solidity programs, all the AMMs, all the staking protocols, all of that? If you didn't have to go through, you know, frankly, the nightmare of using a blockchain, then you could get a lot more done and it would be a lot, lot cheaper. You know, as Mason said, you know, you need to be sure that you're using your blockchain for the right reason. You know, if you're not using it for the one purpose that it is good for, then you shouldn't be using it. This is the truth about blockchains. This is what I'm seeing in the current space as becoming less important. You know, people just throw anything onto a blockchain because they think blockchain. But actually, when you think about whether it's the sort of application that you should be running on a blockchain, 99% of the time, that's, that's not the case. So actually, when people say blockchains work in a decentralized environment, what they should be saying is that blockchains only work in a decentralized environment. There's simply no point running a centralized blockchain non-alcoholic beer, decaffeinated coffee, centralized blockchain. There's simply no point to these things. Yeah? You have to have the decentralization so that I can have the censorship resistance so that we can be free. And if you're not gonna do it for that reason, and if you're not gonna need that ability, then you certainly shouldn't be using a blockchain. You know, a chain is only as strong as its weakest link a system is only as decentralized as its most centralized component. Centralization is incredibly efficient. It is incredibly pernicious. If there is a crack of centralization in your system, it will grow. It encompasses the whole spectrum. Not only is it who runs the chain and who uses the chain, who develops the chain, who comes up with what's going to be happening to it, I feel that this is pertinent at the moment, having witnessed what's gone on. You know, one of the greatest technical feats of blockchain history has occurred in the last couple of weeks. Ethereum managed to change the engine of a moving car. Mind blown. You know, from a technical point of view, I'm a techie, blows my mind what they managed to do. Should they have done that? Am I happy they did it? Am I impressed with the technical know-how required to do it? Yes. But how many of us who, you know, were Ethereans now feel that the chain has given up the game, you know, switched to a consensus model that, you know, loses its monetary premium, the proof of stake versus proof of work. Decentralization is part of everything that you do. Every single bit of your blockchain needs to be decentralized from the people who run it to the people who manage it to the people who develop it. I, I, I would take issue with the fact that you can't predict what is going to be needed for the next 20 or 30 years. The truth is that the internet, probably the greatest piece of decentralized technology that we have come up with to date, runs on protocols that were written 50 years ago. The base layer of the internet is UDP. That hasn't changed for 50 years. On top of that, we built TCP. That hasn't changed for 45 years. On top of that, we built HTTP. On top of HTTP, we built the WWW. Now, did the people who came up with UDP envisage a world with a WWW? Of course not. 
So actually what you need to do is you need to come up with robust protocols, and in my opinion, they need to be finished. They have to be finished for this system to be decentralized. You can stamp a protocol and say, this is it, this is the protocol, get on with it. And once you know what the limitations of the system are, you can work around them. You can build on top of them. And we are actually objectively seeing that happen. We have lots of chains out there, lots of very interesting things going on. And people are now building layers on top of these base layers. Side chains on top of side chains, pools. I mean, I consider Coinbase a layer too. It's centralized. Have more people lost money who looked after their own coins or have more people lost money who stayed with Coinbase? Quite an interesting question. People seem to completely disregard these, you know. You can build a centralized system on top of a decentralized architecture. You cannot build a decentralized system on top of centralized architecture. Each higher layer inherits the security of the lower layers. So your bottom layer, your layer one, the base of all of the things that are going to be going on has to be decentralized. If your base layer is centralized, your blockchain's broken. It's simply not able to do what it's meant to do. You know, when you think about what is a blockchain for, it's not transactions per second. Okay, these is pretty good at that. It's not convenience, because it's pretty hard to beat contactless payments, frankly. And it's not actually smart contracts either, because the entire Ethereum network is less powerful than my single AWS server. Those aren't the reasons we use blockchain. The only reason we use blockchain is because it does the one thing that nothing else can do, and that is to offer us censorship resistance which is derived from its decentralization, which enables us all to be free, which is frankly the end game of all of this. That's why all of us are here. So thanks for listening about decentralization. Um, I actually work as um, the lead dev CTO in a layer one protocol called Minima. And what that tries to do is it tries to put decentralization at the top of all of our requirements. If there's anything that you can add to a chain, if it affects decentralization, if it removes any of that decentralization, it is discarded. The only thing that matters is if your chain is decentralized. I consider decentralization to be a Boolean. True or false, zero, one. It either is decentralized or it isn't we are slowly seeing this play out in front of us in all the chains that are out there. If a single organization, if a single entity, if a single user, if 20 devs disappeared tomorrow, would that affect the chain of choice that you use? Because if that is the case, then this, there's something wrong with the chain. It's obviously not decentralized. There's obviously an attack vector. There's obviously something there that centralizes control. So when coming up with Minima, just a few points about it, we had to think, well, we need everybody to run everything. Every single user has to do the same thing as every single other user, has to be involved in the same way. Every single user not only has to check all of the transactions, they have to be intimately involved in the construction of the chain. And so you say, well, well I can't run this on a Kubernetes cluster a la Polkadot. I can't even run this on a server because nobody's got servers. I can't even reasonably expect you to have a laptop. You know, we're talking India, we're talking China, we're talking all these other countries. So the only device that I can expect you to have is your mobile phone. And so Minima has been written from the ground up as a mobile native blockchain. What this means is that it's as easy to install as going to the Play Store and downloading it. You can download it from the GitHub, you can share it in, you know, from the application itself. And every single user does everything. So now that you've got it running on a system that everybody has access to, you know, hindsight is 2020. With the benefit of hindsight, you can look back on the battlefield of blockchains and you can cherry pick some very, very nice technology 
that simply can't be crowbarred into the current chains. So how do you store these huge databases? You know, how am I going to fit a blockchain database on a phone? You know, these terabytes. There's ways of doing it. Instead of the paradigm which we currently have, where the user stores everything, the miner stores all of the transactions, and you send a transaction, and then they verify whether it's good or not, why not flip that on its head? Why not say, you, the user, can look after your coins. I'll look after mine. You can look after yours. And when you send the transaction, you can add a mathematical proof of the existence and the validity of those coins. And what that does is it's pretty nice because it's a lossless system. So we have exactly the same amount of data in the system, but only the data that is pertinent to you is kept by you. So now we have a system that runs on a piece of hardware that you all have access to. We've removed the nightmare of having to store all of this data. And I guess the final real kicker of Minima, which, you know, which is a, a nice feature, is that you can't have a competition running the network. Every single miner-centric chain, every single stake-centric chain relies on this competition between a certain select set of users who fight with each other to build blocks to get paid. We're incredibly efficient competitors. We are top predator. We're very good at that. And what happens is that you centralize. Yeah? That's, we see this objectively everywhere, all the time. <laughs> Clearly, thank Thanks you very much, Perry. Thank you. Yeah.